नमस्कार आई श्रेयांस मित्तल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सोसाइटी फॉर द प्रमोशन ऑफ इंडियन क्लासिकल म्यूजिक एंड कल्चर अमंग स्टूथ वेलकम यू ऑल टू स्पिक मके रॉन्दू स्पिक मके रॉन्दू इज एन अटेम्प्ट एट यूजिंग आर कल्चर एंड हेरिटेज इज मीन्स टू ट्राई टू फील द वर्ल्ड दैट हैज बिन क्रिएटेड बाई प्रिवेलिंग सर्कमस्टांसिस दिस इज आर फर्स्ट प्रोग्राम एट स्पिक मके रॉन्दू आर्ट सीरीज एंड वी आर वेरी हैप्पी टू हैव श्री ए के एस राधा कृष्णन जी विद टूडे born on 7th feb to pn shriman uh, shrimam unni and k savitri kutti in kerala shri k s radhakrishnan took to painting inspired by his uncle pn narayanan kutti he has bachelor of fine arts and master of fine arts from the very renowned kala bhavan at vishu bharati university at shanti niketan west bengal ramakrishnan ji is uh, radhakrishnan ji is known to install sensuality and life in his works he often attributes the expressiveness of his figures to his father who instilled in him a passion for the potency of ritual dances and performances his sculptures are often larger than life sized placed in the outdoors they evoke a superhuman atmosphere over the years radhakrishnan ji has used sculpting mediums like molten bronze beeswax and plaster of paris we will request ishwan ji to please welcome ks radhakrishnan ji on behalf of all of us and begin with the program in a in a art camp on a sculpture i first met sri radhakrishnan ji along with his uh, painter and writer wife deemi radhakrishnan uh they had some exposure of his sculpture and everything but meeting radha krishnan ji was a very different experience first beautiful thing was to see the processes what he adopts he adopts a, a very different process in sculpture making that was an eye opener and i was very impressed by his humility as well as the detail and the kind of work he was doing later on in shanti niketan while visiting for an exhibition of uh, named pillars of artscape which was curated and organized by sri radha krishnan i could sneak uh, in his house for a biryani and there i also met with him sri shiv kumar sri r shiv kumar and there over over a discussion and uh, many things about the environment of shanti niketan as well as the three great people of uh, shanti niketan nand lal bose vinod bihari and ram shankar bajaj i was really impressed and that time itself i wanted to take his wisdom and his presentation and knowledge to more and more people especially in a spit my kid so here sir i am really impressed with uh, the kind of work you are doing and here it is an attempt to see your teacher sri ram tinkar baj through your eyes i welcome you sir on behalf of spit my kid everybody um yes and to and speak market to have for uh, this chance of showing some of my works along with my masters ramkin kar baj um when you talk about ramkin kar baj i mean it's a very tough task it's not an easy one because um so much is written about him so many people have documented and sort of you know interpreted his sculptures in different ways but as someone who really had the chance to work with to a certain extent i really give a personal view of what i have been looking at now i went to shantinikeyan the early 70s as a student to do painting in kala uh, you know sort of faculty so now when i reached to shantini kevin soon after the admission i had this i was trying to explore you know like um, painting department sculpture and graphics department so while exploring and while entering the sculpture department what was seen there were two sculptures there basically done not very major size it's like kind of four feet size kept on both the sides of the entrance in the sculpture department and um, that time itself you know sort of something that uh, that really touched me something that did to me which I, then i asked who species that then i came to know about ramkinger now 
And on the screen, what you are seeing is the canvas of Kalavaman. The cam canvas is extremely beautiful that you have, you know, all the independent buildings for different streams. You have uh, this huge tree in the middle, which is the Chinese boat guard. And adjacent to that, you have a canteen. And the main thing is that this chata, this platform. So I keep sort of going in the early mornings walk, even now when I am around. And I took these pictures of the Shantikyad and Kalavman of today. And, and uh, except few added buildings in terms of infrastructure. And then you have uh, some of the mural sites, suppose, that you can see mural, which was done by K.J. Subramanian, one of the leading professor, painter, and uh, a philosopher. And uh, this was the painting studio of K.J. Subramanian that he had decided this two-story building to be really painted in black and white. And one of the major work of art that is existing in Kalavavan campus. And then you see this building was actually the studio, painting studio of Nandalal Bose. So we call it Master Mashai Studio. And now it has been converted into or it's being used as the artistry department. And, and maybe for whatever reasons, because he saw that the black and white mural is not so permanent. So, that, so K.J. Subramanian decided to sort of to probably make it in permanent ceramic tiles. So that was all done there in Shantanikhatan and the entire building is covered with this mural by mural the medium of ceramics. And then, um, uh, well, nobody can avoid seeing one of the largest sculpture, one of the foremost sculpture by the foremost sculptor of the country that is Rankinkar Beige and the sculpture is called Santar family. So I'm just showing you a small clip. And yeah, it, you know, because if you want today, photograph of this nature is not possible because there's a canopy on the top of the sculpture. And also this, since it was shot in 1968, 68 or 67, that you can still see the details of the sculpture. Because over a period of time, the sculpture has changed, the surface is really decayed. I'll be speaking about more about this sculpture. So it's a good idea to see what planting in the campus Kalavavan. And uh, many other teachers that you come across and who were there permanently, they were the masters. They really were. One is Pro Professor Shagari Roy Chaudhary, and we call Shagari Da and uh, who I became very close to in the sense that he was the professor in the sculpture department. See, though Rampinkar was living in the campus, he was not part of the faculty. And it was Sharvira Roy Choudhury and uh, who I became very closely working with or worked with. See, he is so different from the rest of the people because he always wanted the tiny sculptures. I mean, the sense that a very small scale backends but very freestanding with the kind of sensibilities that you can see that it's a kind of a thing so spontaneously that he kept on doing it in his own home. He never wanted a stand to sort of work independently. He kept on working on these freestanding figures. And he's very well known for those figures because, I mean, you know, I will definitely talk about Sharbaris sometime in the future about the sensibilities of how he handled the medium clay. See, here also you can see a small clip about Sharpari that, uh, you know, his, his sculptures are of small scale. And that is, yet it is so monumental. And uh, maybe the, the words of the artist who has chosen to be a recluse remains with his work. So in terms of anything larger that he has done, he has maybe, maybe a portrait or a bust or something like that. Otherwise, most of his sculptures are very handy, small sculptures, and he's, since he's very known for those um, sensitive modeling in clay. Now we can see Sharbari, you know, that where Ali Yadbar Khan is seated, 
as a model for Shelbury where he was making the portrait of him because Shelbury did many portraits of many musicians for the reason that he was in close contact with those masters. Also for one of the reasons is that Shelbury has a great collection of music and that's what brought him close to musicians. Certainly here, Bedegula Mali Khan's portrait is done after, after he passed away, after Bedegula Mali. So he couldn't do that when Bedegula was Bedegula Mali was alive. So here we can see the how spontaneously and he I asked him, how could you really get this? That was something so what do you call it? Uh, very intuitive and an instinctive approach that he has taken for this portrait because Shalbury was listening to Bedegulam's music while working on this portrait. So then um, comes the other master who is very famous, uh, Somnath Kaur. Uh, he is probably one of the pioneer in graphics, like in, in etchings and lithographs and many other mediums, woodcuts and things like that. So when we were students in the 70s, and, uh, Somnath Kaur had uh, done this particular mural uh, along with the help of his students outside the graphics department. So when one still, I'm coming back to Rankinger's because Rankinger's culture, when you start talking about, it's something you cannot avoid the material and the method because this technique is absolutely so, so different from any of his contemporaries. He conceives the whole sculpture with so much of planning, with maybe many of the models that are made, sketches and things like that. And he conceived sculpture in terms of the structural stability. And the structure is what he starts, which we call it an armature. So the armatures are normally done um, uh, with uh, a kind of a, a vision that you have it for what could be the kind of a composition. And this, this strong armature inside, sometimes it could be steel, it could be a local material, it maybe it could be bamboo or anything like that. But that's so important for a, for a sculptor to conceive. And most sculptors probably have taken the similar approach, but working on concrete, the medium you know, that he has used was something so different, something that suited his temperament. Something like, because Rankinger kept working on clay and the process of working on clay was like kind of building up on one on the top and then building, there's no limit to the height that you can reach to. But that building process itself was employed in a different manner in concrete, because concrete sculpture also can be interpreted as, say you have a clay or plaster that the sculpture works, you take a mold of it and you have a concrete cast, you can do it. Like, you know, the, the mortar that you fill up into the mold and then you have the mold you break and the cast. But here it is the direct and how? I mean, that's what the big challenge is. The armature on that, he had mixed mortar with the pebbles and cement and then he kept throwing onto the structure where on a day, maybe, you know, a few hours that you work at the site, a, a little bit of volume will be built around. So like that, it went on working, he went on working. There's no question of changing much of it because it was very well planned and Rankinger knew how, and especially this sculpture is so complex in composition. And that complex composition is a very big challenge for even today, you know, for people like us of working almost 50 years, we still really look at how Rankinger had done this. This stands out to be the best, best example for an artist who really got involved with something that that was attained with, with we know, which really suits their, his own temperament and in terms of the availability of the materials. And also you look at the Santals, the Santals are the peasants, they are working in the field, they go back home, that you can see there's a kind of a movement that is forward movement that you can see. And, you know, this, uh, to really come up with this sculpture of this scale, representing the peasants, which was probably absolutely something that has never been done till that day. 
of bringing them much about life to give a kind of a scale of their you know scale of their presence in that which was extremely unusual for uh, contemporary art or or the art of that time and rankinger was he really did something that was a kind of responding to that immediate environment and being a part of or being an integral part of the whole happenings of this life of this presence sometimes then this sculpture was later casted into bronze that was early 19 i think that was in 80s this sculpture was cast with it was a bit a big challenge even for the casting the sculpture because you know while taking the mold you have the pebbles which comes out and this like so a big challenge taking a clay mold the expertise of um, some of the people who really went and studied abroad so the sculpture was cast in bronze and has been brought to uttarayan complex which is where the tagore's home and tagore's other homes and the entire campus which is called the uttarayan where this sculpture is permanently seen in bronze now um it's good that this bronze sculpture is being made that time because today for any reference now well, this has to be really looked at as the original for the reason that the actual original sculpture surface is not the same as it was done years back so you can see you know the the boom the frontal movement and because this multiple figures are put together and yet integrated into one to be a kind of a composition which is a big big challenge in 1938 damkinger was probably 32 years old to come up with this foremost well known sculpture for santal family you can see some of the details of that and uh, here of course it's uh, it's transferred into bronze now that you don't really get to see the exact dimensions of the surface but that's uh, uh, one of the most important sculpture but rankinger we talk about rankinger as a great sculptor he did but in terms of his you know uh, art practice if you really look at the number of sketches the paintings all that if you really put together i mean i don't know the many more works are still to be surfaced but i have have been documenting his work so this is again here you can see the kind of speed that you know uh, as a preparation that he did this painting and some of the sketches connected to milk oil the people are working you know from the, this the same persons who once they were working for working in the field now that they are working for you know the mills rice mills and things like that so you have a mill called one of the sculptures which is still existing in shantideketan and uh, the preparatory drawings that you can see connected you know some of these paintings and um, you know here you can see what was thing because damkinker did a very very many paintings uh, in watercolor in oil and mm -hmm. and pastel or whatever material that comes to handy he kept on practicing because it's just that gives a kind of a, a kind of a, an involvement every time that rankinger is actively sort of kept on painting you know this is a model that you can see of again milk hall from this you can see the kind of ragged surface of the clay and this clay form is still like that it is not even cast Uh, in the bronze or anything else from here you can see that you know that the two figures multiple figures and the detail we have here on this side we have we can see something sort of flying away kind of it could be clothes and uh, you can see at the last when the sculpture comes here you know the kind of uh, speed the kind of you know it's a big shift from his other art practices which we look at it in 1950s that rankinger has done this milk call and um, yeah this has some of the photographs taken early photographs where you still have the real surfaces and um, you know the, the, this tremendous force towards that moving towards the front movement you know and integrating all the figures are together with the kind of clothes that is flying 
and even below with the child one child that is sort of following or running along with them sort of throwing or spreading the dust behind so this one way of this reading sculpture but the, with the same technique to really come up with monumental sculptures of you know santal family and many other sculptures which are existing in shantani kedan by ram kinkar is a big big challenge and i don't think that any sculptor has really sort of worked on anything of this kind till that time but this again a clip where ram kinkar goes to golpada one of the villages but this clip doesn't uh, uh, well i i'm just showing you the kind of environment of the villages where ram kinkar went so while talking about two while discussing about two pieces of ram kinkar i have chosen one is the harvester and the other is the yaksha and the yakshi so the harvester uh, is for that he doesn't have to go anywhere else he, there you can always see that he goes to any of the villages there everywhere shantini kedan is surrounded by villages and paddy field and you know this and you know the kind of natural environment ramp goes to sort of to do instant drawings by being at the site so he sees this people working we can see the very very posture of rankers or uh, this women working in the field you know we can see that uh, this seedling of the paddy field that you can see that uh, the posture that he studies and then try to put them you know maybe sometime with the colors and sometime with the kind of a composition of few figures put together so this activity is the action that he captures in his pictorial frame and all these compositions are decided sometime at the site itself and most of the sketch ramping crew was sort of drawing straight from life and uh, you have you know this the very act itself sort of showing the how all these people are in you know working and uh, ramping is himself when he was working the kind of speed equally with the kind of speed of this people's working you know approach and ramping had also had naturally you know deliver that work so fast it's not something that you know there's this it's so on so much on the spot that he kept working on this watercolors and uh, and this you know with a few lines and and uh, the whole landscape it brings the whole spirit of the action that's happening and also ramping his speed itself while working also is so visible in these watercolors and the kind of compositions that he really does it it's again not that because see certain works that you really do it in your studio and certain things that you do it from life so from life there's no much time sort of to to think about it it is so emotional and that you can extremely visible in uh, in many of his watercolors and uh, and the sketches i keep running these images just to get an idea about how variations are been like here there is a painting a, you know the thick pigmented paintings that he has done with his harvesting uh, where there is a bullock cart and all this paddy from the paddy field that are all getting stored and taken to sort of uh, to the sides but here again you can see some penanting drawings which were also sort of done at the same time you can see whatever because he always had a sketchbook and he always documented all these actions but then what happens later when it comes to making of his sculpture all these collected images from the life are brought to a kind of our brought to the studio space studio mind and that is where rankinger um, started sort of stabilizing a kind of a structure which would really sort of making it making a big departure from what was merely seen and then giving an intellectual a kind of a spacing you really see that some of the basic drawings of the harvester sculpture and that was done in 1940s and um, it, from the profile side what would be the kind of what would be the way the drawing happens because these are all some little books or some pages which we collected while i was documenting his works 
and I could see that there were two members of the structure that was coming like a kind of a triangle first, and then there's a kind of a diamond, a kind of a structure that happens. This harvester is one of his very important sculpture, I believe, in terms of the structure that he has conceived, in terms of you know, bringing a kind of a different dimension to his thought process that he made this, you know, narrowed down. The members are two, the two big structure, like kind of a triangle that narrows down at the top and then two, and then opening up at the height, a different height, where you can see this strong two arms that is holding this sheaf of that paddy. And then, you know, the, the what do you call it? The harvesting, of course, it's called harvest at the thresher. And this thresher to paddy, I mean, you can see the feeling of the going to be beaten to the ground where the paddy gets separated. But the very act of it, it's so stable with the movement that is very evocative. And the headless, there's no head over there. The headlessness also was discussed why is there is no head. And, and I really also personally or anybody would say that you can see the head, it's there. But physically that head doesn't exist for this female figure, the harvester, the peasant. Also because of, you know, the sculpture was conceived for uh, one of the competition that was called the unknown political prisoner. And for him it is, for ranking the unknown political prisoner is the peasant who, is, who really works who really not probably establish any kind of an identity. But I mean, that is what it is. And but I think that was in the 1940s, this competition was made, competition was called, and whatever reason that gave him a real chance to work on a major sculpture of Harvester. And that, uh, you know, after this model in clay, later cast into the plaster of Paris, and late, and you have, um, the sculpture done in concrete in his own technique, his own favorite technique. The sculpture is raised from the ground because he wanted it to be seen, a kind of a different way of looking at it. He wanted it to be seen from below. He wanted that monumental thing that because, you know, this act is probably much more felt seen from below. And I think that was the reason because Many other, both the other sculptures were not really sort of kept, that was on the ground level. And in this case, Rankinger decided to have it really seen from below. And from below also, when you look at it, because that headlessness, that mound, that is, uh, you know, uh, very visibly felt in this sculpture, and it is a strong sculpture. To my mind, even all, all these years, after working, I still wonder what was exactly the kind of, how did someone, or what was that intellectual mind, you know, practice sort of to get to this kind of reform, which is very, very, you know, shocking. And the sculpture is cast later like any other, the other sculptures. It was again brought to, brought to the Lion campus, which is existing the bronze though the bronze is not really of, you know, it has, um, yeah, it, it has, you know, certain surface missing. Of course, that is very, you know, maybe because we don't have, we are living in a country where we don't have the proper commercial foundries that could have brought the exact details of the sculptures. And the sculpture, was, this sculpture was also brought to India Habitat Center in Delhi. And again, where you can see that it has become, you know, the surface has suffered. And, um, but, well, the structure is still there. So sometimes, you know, very, very structure, you know, it can still communicate, but it would have been fantastic having, you know, the detailed surface to sort of to make the touch of the artist, the technique is, which is very exquisite which is very different from the rest of the artists. So now I'm coming back to, you know, sort of, um, you know, the another another sculpture, which is the, which is the Yaksha Yakshi. See, Yaksha Yakshi is done for 
the Reserve Bank of India on the Parliament Street in Delhi. The sculpture is commissioned by them. So when there is a commissioned sculpture, and when there is a sculpture that, that you do it on your own, so there is a totally different approach. But Ramkinkar's approach here with the kind of, he started developing uh, how with the very simple lines that this is probably the first attempt of, you know, doing that Yaksha figure or Yaksha figure. But you can, I don't know whether, how can you read with these few lines, but when you really see it, the final product, but all these lines become so meaningful. And, uh, you know, he kept on doing, evolving from adding more lines and making it a kind of visible figure coming out. Like you can see a kind of a male figure here. You know, the hands are sort of folded and he's still studying and exploring, but doesn't know what exactly the kind of way the structure has to be formed. Because one of the limitations for dark thinkers, I mean, for this commission job was that he was told to do the sculpture in stone instead of his own or his familiar techniques or like working in clay or cast, concrete or anything of that. So he kept on studying this Yaksha Yaksha from life. That So he he was probably one of the first artists in Shantani Ketan who really drew a lot from um, the nudes and he kept practicing working uh, with the references that were there ready made for before him. So, you know, and then structurally sort of uh, interpreting with the different planes and things like that, because he knew the, story, the sculpture is going to be in stone. It's a different approach, which probably he had not done anything of that scale before or even stone carvings. So all these drawings that we really found here and there in his sketchbooks and uh, some of them coming from his collections, I was trying to sort of link it with how he has you know, sort of evolved to reach out to the kind of female figure because it's it's very, very different of, you can really see from all the art that he has done, this culture is so different. Those who are familiar with the Reserve Bank of India and the two, two sort of the entrance of the Reserve Bank of India that you can see, very monumental, extremely monumental, huge sized, almost 21 feet. And you can see so all these drawings that he did, it is just to show how the artist was involved and what could be the kind of height, what could be the kind of um, directions, because always the structure is done with various directed focus. And that sometimes may not be possible in stone carving. But his approach, he took in the drawing that you can see is more like more for clay modeling or, or for concrete, his favorite mediums. So uh, instead of, you know, you know, I'm just coming back to, you know, the actual piece over there, because once he knew that he wanted to do it in stone and then what is the stone that you're looking at? And that was identified in a place called in Himachal Pradesh. So he went to the quarry, the stone quarry where this possible, where the possible stone, the potential stone could be identified. So these are some of the activities of the quarry. You can see some of the letters that in the sketchbook page where you know, the dates that he was going. And it was commissioned to him in the mid, mid 50s, though it took many years for him to complete the sculpture for many reasons because one, the unfamiliarity. But here you see, he's thinking of various forces and things like that. And where he somehow, you know, did, does some sketches and then he does some of the models. And when you do that, and then yourself getting convinced of it. See, he was thinking of the Yaksha Yaksha, so like, like the park hub that uh, Mathura, uh, you know, Kuber, the reference that he was taking from there. And there, that Kubir was definitely sort of worked out for him to be the extra figure. And uh, some of the stories are, of course, that you can see it on the way to the Himachal that he was documenting. So the Kubir figure was identified and he was trying to sort of to connect it with the, because Ram King did many drawings of the classical sculptures that you can see some Durga and Nataraj 
from Aurangabad. A lot of these figure studies were to sort of to get the classical understanding about the classical sculpture and how much that could be really sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, to be brought in terms of its spirit to, to understand his direction in terms of making of a stone sculptures. So these Yekshi figures that you can see it in Mathura Museum, and uh, those are, uh, and this is one of the photographs that was given to me uh, by Ram Kinkar a year before he passed away, some of the books and photographs and all that, I saw this. And uh, that was the photograph, that was the photograph of actually that was the uh, the Dargans Yekshi that we have it in Patna Museum. So now he had settled more or less for, he was drawn to this Yekshi figure. And uh, this was the, you see this is the building, the RBA building and then he was trying to sort of place where, what's the kind of height. We can see somebody sort of, uh, you know, cycling in front of the building and you can see the kind of scale. So what should be the scale and what height and all lot of decisions were to be made. And he started working on from all these drawings and simultaneously he was doing some of the murals, some of the maggots, the models in clay. And uh, you know the posture that you can see, you know that she is standing where really very realistically a kind of composed figure with the clay that he has done with all the kind of uh, you know cones particular style that she is holding something, a kind of a, you know, a, I think it's a sheaf of corn that she's holding on to, which, uh, you know, so the posture is more or less decided that they see, you can see on the left side, a kind of a lotus. So, you know, dealing with that, you know, this, the sheaf of corn that is on the right side, right hand, and the left hand you have, you know, the lotus flower, in the hands of the Yakshi and, and sometimes he was also trying to sort of to impose some of the natural elements like the trees. Now how that, that you know, that uh, chief of corn is getting into a kind of a stylized form. So all lot of experiments, it was still not a decided thing because it was still modeling. And to transfer that into clay, uh, sorry, from clay to stone, it's a different challenge. So ranking that now this is probably one of the sculptures that you can see a straight line on the, the right side of the figure. That straight lines probably sort of he was taking, conceiving as a kind of a stone block. And then how to sort of to make it fully a content sculpture within the kind of given space, give it given stone, vertical stone piece. So uh, different approaches are taken and I was sort of uh, extremely amused about this market studies because Rampinger himself has told many times to many of the students and even to me that it is not the final product, it is the journey, it is it's the drawings and the study that is what is more important and destination could be anything else. You may not end up with a kind of a great quality of sculpture or a great product by the end of it, but in terms of your path that you are following definitely should be convincing for yourself. And if that is convincing, at the end of it, you can really incorporate all that is being recollected and then recollected into an expression. So this extra figure, is the having on the right hand you can see a kind of a sack of coin and on the right side right left hand you have an industrial wheel we can see that but ultimately when he did it see now the hand is changed the posture is changed here he caught he's holding the industrial wheel on the right side and on the left side the sack of coin that was coming now in terms of this idea of bringing yakshi as a you know yakshi and yaksha the kuber the, the kuber, the figure of the wealth, and the yakshi, the, the symbol of, you know, fertility. So we are here also, you can see a kind of a, a pregnant uh, figure and uh, with highly decorated ornaments. So all these experiments, and then of course, Ram Kinkar tried some of the stone carvings, and maybe this uh, stone carving, this one of the photograph taken maybe after the sculpture is completed. And, 
some of the sandstone that was left, he started carving this stone. Now, in front of this, two in front of this RBA building that you can see, these two large figures kept at a much higher platform. They stand together. It is seen together. It's like the Gaurapalakas, the two guardian figures. And they are like kind of ornamentally standing up for people to look up to and to be seen where the Yakshi on the left side of the entrance and the right side you have this uh, uh, Yaksha figure. So when you enter, you can, what you see, <coughs> what you see that this industrial wheel, you know, that sort of symbolically sort of representing about the kind of developments possible or a kind of, um, you know, um, very, very, what do you call it? Uh, um, the, the continuity in terms of development and maybe enlightenment or whichever way that you can, there are many, many interpretations which were done with minimum decorative figure. But of course, uh, you can see the, uh, it's an independent figure placed quite close to the wall, almost like kind of a relief, a big high relief that is coming out of the wall. And the figure is very evocative in the sense that it has certain limitations that Ramkankar always found because of the stones are done in sections. The kind of limitations he never thought what was existing like a huge one single stone was never possible to be brought to the site. And that is where he really had suffered of adding one on the top. So it's a big challenge because if it's just one single stone, then you can really have a different approach. So placing it one on the top was definitely, you know, adding more and more problems to the execution of this work. The female figure, the sheaf of corn, highly decorated on the right hand and on the left hand, the lotus. And you know that she is definitely one of the, you know, you hear the face that you can see is kind of a very strong reference of the Santals. <coughs> now, um, looking at this, was he really you know, happy with the whole process of working with this medium at all. What it would have been if he were given full freedom and to come up with these two figures in a technique of his own, where he is comfortable with working with concrete or maybe a large bronze sculpture or something to be made. <clears throat> That's what that probably you know, something that really stopped him from, because there is a big amount of stiffness in the whole composition, which is very unusual of Ramkinger. But Ramkinger, I remember when I was, you know, very closely, I had a chance to talk to him, you know, many, many, many years after, I'm talking about a year before he passed away. I had the stance of working, I had the stance of doing a portrait of Ramkinger, where we had, spend a lot of uh, time together and uh, you know his silence you know was so so communicative and sometimes he also told me that are that piece which should have been brought down if it could have been brought down so i don't know what he meant by that he wanted that sculpture that the head of yaksha yaksha to be brought down and that was not possible because, you know, the kind of lot of constraints at the site, which didn't let Ramkinger to take a decision. And it was already, already delayed and many, many other problems, which we cannot discuss now here. But for whatever reasons, that thing that remained in the mind of Ramkinger, that it should have been brought down for some more work to be done. I never asked him what would you have done because I don't know. Maybe you know some something that he really sort of kept in his mind, which couldn't be explained, and that was Ramkinger Beige. Well, um, after talking about um, you know, after talking about yeah, after talking about Ramkinger Beige, 
And uh, I mean, not that I spoke uh, about all his works because while doing a retrospective of his exhibition, me as a curator, I have documented hundreds and hundreds of works. And I just could discuss only about two approach. One was a commissioned work. One was a sculpture that he did it on his own and the kind of process I was talking about. But coming to my own sculptures, I mean, um, well, I never did any sculpture before coming to Chandraniketan. And I came to Chandraniketan to be a painter. But then um, I did, for the first time, I took a tool in my hand uh, as, it's, as a woodcutter. So on the wood, I cut this and took out a print. It's a wood print. And uh, that was the class of Somnath Hoor. And then I went to the sculpture class. I was told that there is a class, there is a sculpture to be made. There was a certain amount of clay that was given. Never tried it before. So I just attempted a kind of a small field. And the sculpture turned out to be interesting. At least it was appreciated by Professor Sharbari Roy who I was so close to. He was the teacher, he was the professor, he was the inspiration for me to be taking up sculpture as a specialization, especially after doing this sculpture in my first year. And it's a female told son, he told me, please, whenever you have a chance, you, know, you should make it bigger because it has a monumental quality. I was thinking, my God, it's too early to decide something like that. But the chance came. In, in Bikaner, they have asked me if I could be a monumental sculpture in concrete. Because my approach was to concrete was not ranking curves because that was not possible because that was something typically a ranking curve, the concrete working on the concrete directly. But when I took to doing that, I made a huge entire sculpture in clay and I have made a mold and then cast cement. In, it is in front of the circuit house in Bikaner. And uh, also the Dyson Mir Highway, uh, the same year, 1986, I suppose, when the stands came to me, I did a monumental sculpture also of 13 feet. You can see the molds are all put together and then created that huge sculpture called the woman on the step. Now, you know, the Chandra then had, um, uh, you know, so many villages around. And the workers, the people who are working, they are really working on the right, on the roadside. We can see that they are preparing jaggery, you know, from the date palms and they are selling on the street side. So they are so self-employed. And sometimes during different seasons, they are not harvesting seasons, they really take up this kind of jobs. So people, you know, are very simple, Santals, the roads are all like kind of some kacha road that we can see and whole Shandhanika environment is so natural. So inspiring, especially for an art student, it is you become one with the nature. And then while coming one one time that I was coming from one of the villages, Sandal villages, and I found somebody on the roadside. He's standing and giving me giving me a smile and didn't speak much, but then he brought out just two words, Dada Ruti. And this asking, this expression, asking for bread. And with this kind of a, a kind of an innocent smile, that was something that touched me so much. I asked him to come and sit behind my side. I took him to my studio and made a portrait. And after doing the portrait, he went back. He came, he went, I gave him some money. And after an hour or so, he came back with a clean shaven head. And here, Dada, I'm here. So that was where I really uh, changed my sculpture also. And then he became, you know, he. I asked his name, his name is Musui. So this Musui is a Sandal boy, probably was of my same age. So where I could really sort of connect with myself and I, I don't know, there was something that was connected between us. And uh, that was, uh, then he became a model for the department. And in the department, uh, many people started using him as a full model because he was an excellent model because he could become a kind of a complete nude uh, model, unlike many other male model. And uh, he had a kind of an innocence, uh, his skin eyes and uh, kind of presence that he's standing uh, for everybody, here I am, that kind of thing. So I did this sculpture and they tried cast it into cement. And when I really left Shantaniketan, 
getting a fellowship that brought me to Delhi. I carried nothing else other than that head and that head was cut and that was a part of my, my a permanent fixture in my studio. And this Busu's head is, it was everywhere. Whenever you change the studio because you don't have a studio of your own. So you shift, but you shift with Musi. So Musi has been following uh, wherever I went. And they made this studio in Chhatrapur near Mahroli in Delhi, where I started working 90s, early 90s. I think 98 was planned and 93 I had the studio working. And um, those years I was working on sculptures of a different kind. You can see, many people say, oh yeah, you can see some Tom Kinker's influence and things like that. That, uh, you know, the planes, different planes and volumes and are um, just opposed to sort of to create a kind of a uh, positioning, you know, they, especially the sculpture. I mean, you can see a female figure precariously positioned and on, you know, onto a base, split to base. So this kind of subjects that was so much, uh, I was involved with this uh, existential problems, I mean, I suppose, because that was the period. This is how I come back from Khajuraho, I made a Chandela rider. And then I kept working on various sculptures, which were probably more, very small in scale. And then I found a kind of a very, very big sponsor who really offered that, well, uh, I would uh, support for you to do some large sculptures because that was a dream for any other, any sculpture for the trees. Yeah. I have um, uh, done this uh, uh, large monumental sculptures. So this is a site uh, in France where uh, I could install. So this sort of uh, sponsorship was extremely unexpected and uh, to a certain extent uh, just, just luck that uh, I found this guy who ordered me any sculpture that you make, please show me before you sell to anybody else. And there was no market, there was no question of selling anybody else because there's nobody else is standing for that. So here, whatever I made, I started showing him and he said, please send it. So I kept on sending all the sculptures abroad. But at the same time, I made two editions, one editions because bronze has that facility that you can make one, you know, one edition of it and the, the same mold you can use for another wax, like another edition. So this this was a display that has happened on the Park Street in Calcutta, sponsored by the Jindal uh, and the Park Hotel uh, APJ group. So the sculpture was exhibited and uh, so, you know, this, all these kind of sculptures while making, Musi was in my studio, always the Musi's head was there, wherever I enter, you get to see the portrait, but many years it was there in the studio. But it was sort of, um, you know, like in 1996, I suppose I was commissioned by one of the travel house asking me if I could do a sculpture based on travel as a concept. And travel, when I thought maybe people carrying, because Calcutta, I come from Calcutta and the rickshaw, the pull rickshaw, the handful rickshaws were uh, what I thought maybe you know, could be an interesting idea in a modern time, something very contrast to that. And also to be kept on the rooftop, you know, when you, you don't see a rickshaw on the rooftop. And also then I was thinking who would be pulling that rickshaw? And it was so easy for me to decide Oh, yeah, who could be that? Why not? Check with Musui. Yes, and here Musui decided I wanted Musui. So I made a small model of this picture, and then the actual size of Musui. Musui was very comfortable, or really choreographed figure standing between the two uh, arms, you know, sort of both the arms are holding onto the uh, handles, and the passenger becomes a crow. And now many people ask me, why is that that you don't have a passenger? It's only a crow. Because crow comes and goes. It's like a memory. It doesn't stand there because nothing comes, nothing is permanent there. And Musi carries his memory here. Well, the sculpture is installed. You can see it on the top of the rooftop of the travel house in 
in Delhi. So the rickshaw is big enough that even I could sit. So I don't know. It was from that time onwards probably Musi started taking me along, and my journey with Musi started. So Musi become Musi. So while this journey, I was thinking of a journey with Musi. I was just thinking that can that be possible only with Musi unless Musi has a counterpart. So that's where I conceived exactly. Musi's head, I have added hair and you know the female counterpart is created out of Musi and I called it Maya. Maya in Bangla, they call it the girl. Basically it's Maya. So Musi and Maya is becoming a kind of two characters that I have been engaged with from the mid 90s. So Maya is uh, in one of the posters like kind of again the palm grove and the Musi is sort of getting very celebratory, kind of a posture, same site. So they are all put together, you know, in one of the sites in France. So all these sculptures that has been happening, which I told you about, I had a, I had a ready-made buyer. And the sense that I could show him if sometimes he says yes, sometimes, you know, I really find different kind of buyers. So things were really building up around. And um, in the you know in different parts of the country and the world, I should say, because of my exhibition in Calcutta and uh, one of the exhibitions that I had in '93 in Paris. So all this sort of together really created a kind of a you know, opened up space for me to sort of to be going, you know, very creative, not bothering much about you know how will I support myself because the, the sculptures are start sort of supporting. Uh, independently to sort of to get them cast into different expensive mediums like bronze. And uh, this is one of the clip which is not going to be, you know, again, that was connected to the rat trap. Now, Adur Gopala Krishnan's rat trap was sort of very inspiring actually. And it was always in my mind, maybe, you know, that a sculptural a idea may come up with that. But here, Musui is catching a rat, he is sort of holding a rat trap inside, but he himself is in the trap that you can see. So I'm just trying to sort of to see some series of sculptures and the kind of the kid doing a lot of drawings. So rat catcher, who she become a rat catcher, as simple as that. And she becomes, the Maya becomes a writer and also she becomes a creature. And uh, Musi becomes the Jesus and also a devil. And she is a pianist and Maya Musi becomes a Brahmin. Now, Musi becomes Mullah Nasruddin while you know, Maya becomes a graduate. Because in Shantani, as a graduate, you get this leaf, you know, which we call it Shaktaparni, but Chhatim in Bangla. So we get this uh, leaf as a symbolic gesture. And uh, so Mohan Jadaro, dancing girl, is you know, made to be life-size. She goes to Shantani as a student and become a graduate. And she's holding with pride, you know, what she has been received. So now you have um, the same sculpture I have donated to Kamala Nehru College in Delhi and very well received by uh, students and an appropriate site, I felt. And she becomes a postgraduate and also She's just vertically, you know, she's holding on, she's a horizontally, she's being placed on a vertical stand against against any odds. She's still holding on to herself or she's holding on to the values. So, and Maya becomes on the crest, she's sort of holding to herself on the crest of a wave. And Kalamandala Musui, and while she becomes a windmill, and Musi becomes equally like a windmill, and Musi and Maya, they are holding each other's head. I mean, they are inseparable. They are just two halves are put together to become one. They are holding on to oh, the simple, for the first time, they're coming onto one platform. She becomes an angel. Angel landed from somewhere, from, and also he becomes the Nataraj. And uh, why within only the Indian, and things like that, and she becomes the, the Mona Lisa. 
So, and my uh, place with Musri, and the, here Musri becomes the Mahishasu, so she is the Durga posture, and also a tree goddess. And you know, they're together on the railings with my sponsors from Denmark, and uh, they have probably the biggest collection of my sculptures over a period of time, and they have the fantastic sights, the walking on the water. And you know, Musi or oh, sorry, Maya becomes a an arrow and the bow together. So this is a model which was done in four feet size. But later I had the chance sort of to make it bigger, and uh, I felt it is an appropriate sculpture to be placed for a snataka for someone who is coming out of the university. And uh, if she is the one to decide to take off, she's so independent. She doesn't have. She doesn't need anybody to be setting her. She decides where to go and when to go. So she is the arrow and the bow. The sculpture is in the canvas of Uttarai and Shandini Kedan. The sculptures continued with a series of multiplicity of compositions, which becomes a kind of a global structure. And it is being placed in the HCL building. And also, when India, uh, Delhi government has developed a site called Garden of Five Senses where I have done this large monumental sculpture. So I was sort of, uh, you know, shifted to my colony, you know, in Chhatrapur with a lot of difficulties, a lot of problems, electricity problem, water problems, all that was there. And the colony was coming up. So I could see a colony that is getting mushroomed, with small little, you know, clustered uh, homes, they call it. But it's all basically temporary structures were coming up. And then all those people, I sort of thought maybe they are all, they don't have an identity of their own, they are just small people. So I started making these tiny people and casted them in hundreds. And I put them together to create a series of sculptures called the Human Box. And these people are getting into all kinds of geometrical oriented figure boxes. And uh, so I just opposed to this geometric and, and the organic. They are getting into the vessels has become content. And there is like kind of a global uh, kind of uh, immigrant and immigrated space. And they are like becoming a ritual, you know, content. They are like, maybe I did the sculpture in Puri. And to get into Mayas and Musi space. And you can see Musi holding onto this human box. And this two, for the first time, decided to make a travel together, Musi and the Maya. Sculpture is small in scale, around 12 to 13 inches. So I made them into five, and then that becomes six and ten, hundred, weaving into them, making into hundreds of these figures. So what happens is that all these figures are really put together to sort of to get into or get onto a kind of a slanting space, which I call it a ramp. And they are gradually ascending into a kind of a higher platform where you have the larger than life size, a figure is being placed, and the posture itself is saying that this is Ramakrishna, and Ramakrishna is much higher, enlightened, kind of sage character. And Musi and Mayas are really sort of looking up to what this Musi, the Ramakrishna also has the same Musi. And the people who are also on the ground are Muslims and Mayas. So to be perfect also doesn't have to be someone coming from outside. It could be one from the crowd. So to be perfect doesn't have to be uh, coming from an unknown world. So Muslim and Maya series, I started working in hundreds and hundreds of these figures. And the counterpart of Ramakrishna, the Sharda, is being seated among the crowd. Again, because I wanted these two ramps are put together to form a kind of a composition, which is extensively shown in various exhibitions. You can see some photographs taken by my very close friend, Pradas Gupta, seen from the top. And I just cannot avoid showing these images because they are some of the best compositions. I have seen much more I have understood with his photographs about my own sculptures. And coming back from Cairo, I made a cell kit with a guardian goddess. And Musi was still in Shantanike, then working in one of the tea shops. And um, I keep going to Shantanike, then and, uh, 
you know sometimes get to see him and and uh, he's changed but yet there is a smile that is permanently there that look was so strong so he made a series of sculptures called the free hold and um, this free hold series basically was coming from with not a kind of a reference straight from the movement that's happening outside it's not a visual reference it's just sort of positioning it on the crest of the pillars in a kind of um, uh, what do you call it a movement that occurs from within it has no reference to any movement that is happening outside so i kept doing a lot of series of sculptures maybe something he is on the elbow she is also standing vertically with the elbow so all kinds of movements that was definitely from the very beginning that my primary interest was continued with this freehold sculptures and what she the writer is always now always there and uh, she is very precariously positioned but i think uh, i don't find it uncomfortable so maybe the same way i can expect others also to be looking at that you know that this is a very comfortable posture for someone to be in a no covid situation on crest of the pillar can still be writing upside down the seas and the whole throne with the big basic very basic touching on the ground she has thrown herself into the space and you can see him upside down making all kinds of movements but what are these movements you know what is that this free hold is meant for you know when you talk about are you freeing are you freeing yourself in the process of that freeing from what you are you are free holding i mean you are holding on to yourself and there is no no link no attached string which is coming from outside to sort of to put them you know hold them or restrict them but that is what the kind of liberated souls this Moses and Mayas made in many many numbers like this for two years. I have collected all these figures for myself. I have not really shown to anybody. And after two years, I took them to a museum show in Bombay. And uh, when they are all put together, it's almost like becoming a kind of you know sort of you can walk through that with the kind of uh, you know walking through these different movements like discovering yourself and also connecting. you generating that kind of a movement that can still be making yourself so flexible now maya walking on the wave and she is instead of getting onto a boat carrying one instead of going home she has a home with her in and sheltering yourself you know and instead of freely finding from outside and also wants to be a preacher when there is a crisis she becomes a kind of a, a a thought tattle and uh, and uh, kind of a preaching to be done when there is a crisis I and mean, i don't know what who we I, i think we all expect maybe many more uh, tattles coming and preaching to us we we get to hear them maybe it's happening musi decides to look at or maya decides to look at the mirror to see herself for himself and there's a there's this sculpture is being made there where there's a pitfall and there is a kind of a void space that you can walk through and here there is a human square there are a lot of people below there is a pillar in the center there is a musi standing on the top of it and this pe- people are busy with themselves but then somebody is definitely taking a look from above and that is what exactly when i was told to do a big sculpture of to what I, mean, i wanted to do a big sculpture for shantidhi then kalabhavan at the time that 19 uh, sorry 2006 i was invited to kalabhavan on the occasion of 100 years of shantankar where i have done this sculpture the terra fly you are looking at it or not you are being looked at there is somebody above us we have to look up and then this little tiny figures are this hundreds of them getting cast it comes to me and then they are really put together on a human square where they really have you know they merge in the space they sometimes they are in the corporate get into the homes and the boat and then they become a human web where the boat is inserted and the head is inserted inside the human web 
and they are like kind of a smoke that comes out of a pipe. There is a kind of a small breeze, the light, and also steam that comes out of the vessel. And there it's like puttu, we call it puttu in one of the dishes in Kerala, that we have steam that comes out while opening that you can see. And then boil water, boil water and hot tiffin box. And you know this, uh, uh, by cooking you have the smoke and then you have the steam together. And you have idli vessel where you can see again while steaming the fire and, and the heat and everything steam basically and the fan, the air that circulates. So in the Kerala flood, I did a sculpture that the boat has become about the building. What has come about, you can see the people and what is normally much below the home. And the torch light, the people, these people become the light. And this the rubber, you know, that is a rubber, tap rubber that is sort of flowing onto this coconut shell. And the fireflies around the lantern. The terra fly, sorry, this is not a terra fly, but this is the, uh, what you call it, you know, this, uh, uh, all this little moth that is reaching out to the light. And in the process of reaching out there, they really lose their life. So based on the same theory that people want to be there where they are not, that philosophy has always been there with me that everybody wants to be elsewhere. And there is a strive for that. But maybe by boat, they are really reaching maybe to the other shore, other, other part of the country, but they don't really make it. So you can see a series of this large ramp where the entire sculpture is there with the light reaching out to the light, but uh, doesn't make it. A dissenting and dissenting figures are put together. I don't know where to stop. I keep doing these kind of sculptures. And sometimes when it becomes much bigger and where my hands doesn't reach, then I stop it. So there's no limit to what. And then I keep going to Musui. I see him. He's also sort of growing. Um, well, his beard also has turned gray. I get to see him. Shantani Kedan. Yeah, we communicate even without much talking. We are there. I I keep going to Shantani Kedan. That will be something that really sort of takes me to the place. I started doing many, many sculptures of figures that put together hundreds and hundreds of figures are getting cast and was coming and then making a large. I commissioned to myself. I wanted to do a large ramp maybe around 20 meters. So there were, I don't know how many, it's not hundreds, it is thousands, the figures. Years I casted, years I casted, and I completed the complete sculpture. And um, well, there's, if, the, if this 20 meter figure has got some of the larger than fig, life size figures, you know, that starts with the pillar on the horizontally placed and then cart wheeled, to the large top, at the end you have a wall where you have this shadow and symmetrical figure that is coming at the end. And um, the shadow and the symmetry, that was sort of making it sure to be really defining the fact that there's a space beyond. And this liminal figures, liminality, you can see the scale of the sculpture with my presence. I really, I still, I don't have that sculpture with me, but only while showing only I get to see it because I don't have space of that scale. But I really look up to get to see that sculpture when it is on display. And um, this is a very huge... Uh, a, this is a very huge sculpture uh, which was done in um, 2008, I suppose. After that, the sculpture was shown in different cities. And this is again one of the sculptures that was, because I think we really have, I really have to sort of to conclude my presentation with showing some more sculptures. And, uh, you know, this sort of sculptures of large sculptures, which I wanted to do always is the public sculptures. This is a city called Kalikat. 
I was commissioned, not I shouldn't say I was commissioned, I wanted to give a sculpture to the city, but I wanted the right site. The right site was the center of the city, which is called Maranjara. I, and I have put together this, this, what you call it, this granite sculptures, granite forms. And on the granite, this, in the time, I wanted to depict the time for many reasons. I don't know, Kala Pravaham. That was the time types. I wanted to represent it with a kind of a composition. And uh, the sculpture was brought to the site. The, the good grass got spoiled and all. The later, many people started coming slowly into watching the sculpture because, you know, it's something in the middle of the night I did it because so that no public will interfere with my installation. So next day morning, I was wondering what will happen because of the huge trucks and things like that has entered into the park, their own park where they come and sit, spend a lot of time. And uh, the next day morning, I could see watching, keeping myself at the corner. And you can see the sculpture is very well placed, seen against the sky. And you have this carved, the tiles, mango tiles are carved on the and also I see that, that the people are taking selfies and photographs that made it give a big lift to me. The sculpture is accepted by the public. And then what I did was I I have I've kept all those stones, the concrete part of it is sunk in, and then I started making some mound with the grass. The sculpture is complete like that. But you can see the crow sitting on Musui. And they will do its job of throwing and all that you can see. It. But then public is there to take care of it. I always felt because I am somewhere else. But I saw in one of the newspaper a photograph of three men standing and cleaning my musui on the top of uh, that granite stone. They made it their own. And the sculpture is there for a long time, I'm sure. It would still, because it's in the hands of the public, it's not. This museum really is sort of well placed there. And then I did a couple of sculptures in Bombay. And, um, you know, some of the museums are sort of spirally reaching out to a kind of a different space. I go to my foundry in Rajasthan where I keep checking and putting them together and building. And this large sculpture was some, it was brought. It was brought to um, the site where I wanted to do it in my hometown in Kerala, where the Kotem, where I belong to. And uh, I was given one of the primary site, a park where people will come and sit and spend a lot of time with my sculptures. It's the Stidi and the Gati, you know, it is the Musui. One Musui is sort of putting both the legs on his head and Musui and Maya with the kind of different movements on both the sides. And you can see how height, uh, where I'm standing there in the middle of it, you can make out the scale of the sculpture. And the same piece has been placed in Bangalore on the roadside. And then I put on another large sculpture, which is, uh, um, which I really felt some of the right space when you get, you want to donate a sculpture because it's like you can connect it. I wanted this large museum to be placed somewhere in Goa. And I was given total freedom of choosing the site. So I made this, you know, tiled home, the Mangalore tiles and things like that. And after casting in Jaipur, the sculpture was brought to the site and the sculpture is installed. The whole entire building with the concrete and the, the arched building is, is in bronze on the promenade of, of the on the river uh, Mandavi, you can see that in Panjim, this sculpture is being placed. It's a very beautiful location. And already my friends start sort of uh, being with me to share the experience of what it is to be along with the sculpture. And the sculpture is now there in Goa for all the time to come. It's almost like Musi is there taking a look for all the people who are outside this also are sort of very welcomed by Musui. And that's what I should say that uh, this is my last uh, image that where I am stopping. And I thank you so much for viewing it. 
so we really really thank you i think this was a very beautiful journey it was not just a session and some of the key takeaways i think one thing you mentioned about ram kinkar badge he, he was a, he was an aesthetic person i think everyone who has some knowledge about badge he will always connect with the fact that he was a very aesthetic person and very spiritual as well and that it is not the final product it is the journey that matters so what we get to see right now is just the product not the journey so thanks thanks a lot for the journey and also for your journey the the way you met uh, musui and you empowered a person from santhal to be- become what not uh, musui became maya he uh, like they both became so many things and i can i can i could see a continuity you know a continuity from uh, the ram kinkal badge uh, sketches to your sculptures i think the figures were very similar and uh, you talked about the technique the armature and the way it affected your sculptures and you you made some some like they were so gravity defying and so beautifully put up so it it's unbelievable the way they were brought up i mean on such a big scale there is weight on the top and just a vertical pillar which is supporting it it was wow uh but uh, although i think had you continued we would have loved to continue this for as long as you could have spoken uh but there is some gravity of time That's right. The time constraint. So sometimes, yeah, we can do it in a different series. Sometimes we can show different uh, sculptures independently. One can discuss in terms of its concept, and then uh, you know, individually pick up certain things and to talk about in details. Especially, I mean, um, Ram Kinkar's incredible number of sculptures of different kinds. You know, we can really hope to discuss something for the future. I'm sure. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so uh, we uh, won't be taking any more of your time and of our viewers who are waiting for uh, some more action so thank you thank you so much sir again i'll just want to make a few more announcements uh, before ending this session uh, we stand in solidarity with the countless artists and artisans who are dealing with the repercussions of the current crisis we have an ongoing crowdfunding campaign on milab.org please visit milab.org/fundraisers/support-spicmake uh kona ji would you like to give a uh, closing statement and then we'll end the session sir thank you for a fascinating brilliant journey of of you know of, of the entire um, the entire lifetime of, of your own journey at vishwavidyalaya university with your guru ram kinkar ji's journey and then your own journey with with the sculpture it is just brilliant i mean i think there are no words really to even uh, this probably is once in a lifetime experience for a lot of us here who are listening to you and and and, and just thank you but one one thing that that caught me is, is what you said is that the sculpture is theirs and it's for them to take care and and and, and yeah. that's that's what it is ultimately that is is for all of us and it's for all of us to take care of it and that's I'm just sorry. very emotional once once it goes to public then it is a, it's a piece for the public to live with it to understand it to it becomes an integral part of the society and that space that it belongs to you know absolutely yeah. that's it. just brilliant sir thank you so much for for sharing your experience thank you, thank you so much thank you thank you. thank you sir thank you sir Okay.